And what's remarkable is that he was, you know, he was heir to like a, a, a massive kingdom. I mean, the equivalent in today's uh, estimation of, of billions and billions of dollars. Mm. But he gladly renounced it all. Here we go. Welcome to a special edition of the Focusing Way podcast. I'm your host, David Battistella. We call these special editions The Way is Love. Find The Focusing Way on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and our website, thefocusingway.com. Celestial beings are no myth. They've been written about for centuries. Long before UFOs and aliens became the popular culture, saints and mystics, pontiffs and prophets were tuned to the messages from God through the holy angels. Nine choirs strong, an unimaginable number of angels were created at the moment of creation. God assigned one to each and every one of us to be our protector and friend, our very own angel guardian. If you are hearing my voice right now, count yourself as a person who has a guardian angel. The holy angels are to be taken seriously. Throughout scripture, we see the angels announcing, assisting, overseeing, and protecting. From Job to Christ himself, the holy angels of God assiduously love him and carry out his will. They are infused with incredible powers, incredible love, devotion, intellect, and wisdom, and can in an instant discern, defend, and act on your behalf. Father Robert Nixon, who spoke with us after his translation of a book on humility, is back today to share with us his insights and discoveries. Father Nixon joins us from Australia to discuss the work, Meditations on Holy Angels, written in the 15th century, by St. Aloysius Gonzaga. And joining me now from Australia is Father Robert Nixon. Father Robert, welcome back to The Way is Love on the Focusing Way podcast. Thank you very much, David, and uh, special blessings and good wishes to you and all your listeners on this, the Feast of the Sacred Heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. That's a beautiful message. And I was wondering if we could begin with the prayer that's at the start of this book in the introduction to yeah. our holy angels. Yes, we begin uh, very appropriately with a prayer. Uh, Sancte Angele Custodes, de vendite nos, Sancte Aloise, ora pro nobis. Our holy guardian angels, defend us, and Saint Aloysius, Pray for us. I think a very appropriate way to begin. Amen. Thank you, Father. We just celebrated the feast day of St. Aloysius on June the 21st as well, and we're recording this, as you mentioned, on the 24th of June, the feast of our Lord's Sacred Heart. So beautiful. Uh, I just wanted to begin, if you could just speak a bit about St. Aloysius Gonzaga and his intense devotion to the holy angels. Yes. Uh, so Saint Aloysius Gonzaga is, is one of the wonderful saints within our uh, pantheon of, of uh, canonized saints. And he was uh, born of a, a very rich and noble, prominent family. His family were really the, the leaders of Mantua, which was, uh, you know, which is a substantial and beautiful region of Italy. So he was born to the very highest echelons of society. Um, but very early in his life, he realized that our true glory is not in this world, but in the heavenly kingdom. And he entered at an early age, the Jesuit order, and um, he, he actually, he didn't live for terribly long. He passed away in his 23rd year, but he had exemplified this kind of angelic innocence during his whole life. And he ended his life um, because of his, his charitable actions in serving in a hospital for those who were afflicted by the plague, which I think in this day and age is a, a particularly uh, relevant thing and, and something which people can relate to in a particular way in this time of pandemic. But all throughout his life, he, he had a, a special devotion to the holy angels and in particular to the guardian angels. And um, this is something which is very much brought to the fore in this book. And I think it's something which is uh, worthy of, um, of consideration by all Catholics in this day and age. 
I wholeheartedly agree. And there's also a very interesting story about St. Aloysius's birth. Yes, there is. So, um, in fact, during his birth, his mother suffered terrible labor pains, and it seemed to be questionable whether he was actually going to, uh, to be born alive. And so it came about that he was, um, according to the author of his life, that he was actually baptized before he was fully born. And while we don't know exactly the practicalities of how that happened, uh, we know that it meant that he was uh, completely consecrated to God and completely washed of the stain of original sin, even before he entered fully into this life. It's an incredible, I mean, just as we, as you um, discover those moments in history to think of the, um, how devote people were and that was not out of superstition it was out of a, a genuine wanting no, to no. be to be baptized yeah, yeah yeah and yeah you know and uh, and this was actually a, a common practice uh, throughout well throughout the entire middle ages until you know I i'm not sure how long ago but the idea that baptism was so important that uh, children in danger of birth should be baptized immediately. And of course, today, our, our theology of baptism perhaps um, recognizes more strongly the, the capacity of the grace of God, which of course is something which people were always aware of. But still, the importance of that sacramental cleansing, you know, and we've got strong scriptural testimony to that. Those who are baptized and believe will be saved. It's uh, so beautiful. Um, could you share a little bit about what the saint was like as a young person? He demonstrated great devoteness early in his life. Yeah, so he, he um, showed uh, very intense devotion and piety from a very early age. And um, in fact, um, at, at, a, at the age of just nine, he devoted himself to perpetual virginity before a shrine of the Blessed Virgin in the city of Florence. And um, I mean, this, this commitment was, uh, I think something which could only have been divinely inspired that he became aware that his calling was not to the kingdoms of this world, but uh, to the kingdom of heaven. And what's remarkable is that he was, you know, he was heir to like a, a, a massive kingdom. I mean, the equivalent in today's uh, estimation of, of billions and billions of dollars. Mm. But he gladly renounced it all. And he, he resolved at a very early age to enter religious life. And this was, um, this was actually at the beginning, not something which his family encouraged. You know, they thought, well, you know, you're only a, a young child. Can you really make this decision? Mm. But the remarkable thing was that he stood firmly by it and he brought it to fulfillment. So. Uh, yeah, and you know his people who knew him described him from an early age as being uh, being like an angelic being in human form. Yeah, and he took that to his death, as you mentioned uh, just in the previous answer. That he, as a as a Jesuit, was begging to go and assist the ill during the plague, and eventually he himself succumbed to that same plague. So, but his. But that's a testament to his devotion as well, because his earthly life, he understood, as many saints have this uh, inner knowledge um, of sanctity from a very young age. But I just want to read a little quote from the book, which is beautiful. Uh, quote, he studiously avoided private contact with women, even those of the most oh, yeah. illustrious and respectable rank and those related to him by blood. In fact, he even preferred that chaperones were present when he met with his own mother, close quote. Whoever speaks about custody of the eyes anymore, can, can you explain why this yes, is an important in, virtue? Indeed, indeed. So, you know, when we read these texts which were written in the early modern era, we may sometimes find things which seem to us a little bit strange or a bit eccentric or a bit extreme. But uh, this virtue of custody of the eyes was something which he, he understood very well. And it's related elsewhere that there were people who knew him for three years or more 
and didn't even know the colour of his eyes. So the idea of, um, of keeping custody of one's senses, of not permitting oneself to be distracted by the, uh, the allurements of this earth. And of course, we can see from this that when he talks about uh, the allurements of this earth and custody of the eyes, he's not only talking about, you know, sexual lust and everything, um, but he extends this also to all kinds of human contacts so that even the bonds of family, which in themselves are, are good and noble and natural, but at the same time he, he puts a restraint upon them, realising always that although these things in themselves uh, are, are very good and, uh, and, and not to be denied, but at the same time he realises that his higher destiny is for the eternal kingdom of God. So he chooses for this, uh, you know, this, this, this path, of uh, a strict preservation of innocence. And I think it's, it's a remarkable grace and which God, um, God actually rewarded by granting this death at an early age. Yeah, the words of St. John of the Cross come to mind, God alone, God alone, God alone. And that seems to be uh, this, yeah. sort of, this sort of um, piety, uh, this intellect yeah, so, and devotion. So, yeah, so he exhibits this this kind of uh, single-minded piety, this, this completely pure and, uh, and utter devotion. And, you know, I think it's like a, a fire that burns very intensely. And when a fire burns very intensely, you know, it's, it's a beautiful and wonderful thing. But, uh, you know, it, it, can't, it can't last for very long. And I think that's to some degree exemplified in the life of St. Aloysius. I mean, God gives us each a full life, whether our life lasts for 20 years or whether it lasts for 100 years. And in his time, St. Aloysius achieved spiritually uh, the highest degree of perfection in all the virtues. And of course, we understand that for the fire to burn, the material has to be prepared very well. Uh, so, um, yeah. Yeah. So he was also um, a great adorer of the Holy Eucharist. Uh, he was indeed. And this is one of the things which comes out in the uh, series of devotions to him, his, uh, his great adoration and reverence for the Eucharist. And we're told that he received the Eucharist very frequently. In those days, David, I think it's important to remember that receiving the Eucharist daily was a, you know, a virtually unheard of thing. So um, weekly or even monthly reception of the Eucharist would have been consi considered to be frequent mm -hmm. reception of the Eucharist. But it was his practice to fast for three days before the Eucharist, to prepare himself diligently by prayers and penance. And then after the reception, to spend further days in thanksgiving and uh, fasting for, for the wonderful gift he'd received. So this devotion to the Eucharist, I think, is something which is so exemplary, and uh, just reading about his own devotion is enough to, uh, to fill the heart with a kind of renewed devotion to the awesomeness of this mystery. Yeah, it does. And it just, as you say that, it really reminds me that those precious moments after we've received our Lord into our bodies are very precious. And I just want to remind any listeners that please take 15 minutes while Christ is in you when you've just received him to really uh, yeah, use yeah, that yeah. time. That is the most intimate time you can have with our Lord. Yeah. And Many people are already yeah. out the door, or in the car, or off having a yeah. coffee. Oh, uh, you know, David, you're, you, you're very right in, in saying this. And of course, today, I think it's probably not realistic for people to spend three days in preparation for the Eucharist and spend a couple of days in Thanksgiving afterwards. But even if we um, don't spend quite so long to spend that little bit of time in preparation beforehand, and also in that time of, of prayers afterwards, and it's my own experience, and I know it's the experience of a lot of Catholics, that after reception of the Eucharist, they're really drawn to that uh, silent prayer, to the prayer of contemplation. And it, it, it's something which exceeds our own capacities, because at that time we have within us the, the body and the blood of Christ himself, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, this 
is the, the, the key time, the prime time for the experience of union with God, of contemplation. And as you say, if it's only 15 minutes or whatever, you know, that's not a big sacrifice out of anyone's schedule, but it can really work wonders. And, uh, yeah, I would definitely encourage people to, to adopt that practice. Yeah, as I read about this saint, the words in service or be in service kept coming to mind. And um, how does yeah. that service, that being in service, mirror the work of the holy angels? Well, you know, the holy angels, um, the angels were created by God as his servants, and they constantly exercise themselves in service both of God and also of humankind. And of course, as you know, there are, you know, so many ranks of different angels. There are nine ranks of angels, beginning with the seraphim, the cherubim, the thrones, the dominations, the virtues, the powers, the principalities, the uh, archangels and the angels. Now, it's only the uh, archangels and the angels who actually... Um, are involved in the things of this world. Mm -hmm. But they devote themselves entirely to the service of human beings. And um, I think this offers us a kind of model for our own lives. I mean, we often think about imitating the lives of the saints, but sometimes we can think about, we can forget that the good angels, in fact, are also saints and that we're called to imitate them as well. And this is something which uh, St. Aloysius did very consciously in his uh, dedication to purity, innocence, and also a complete free availability of service to the will of God through the service of his brothers and sisters. Yeah, I'm just going to read a quote of his right now. Quote, Let whoever is blind, whoever is uncertain of their journey, and its peril similarly trust in their angel with confidence and faith for it is the providence of almighty god which assigns and directs this angelic protector close quote can you speak about that yes indeed so um he's talking here about the the guardian angel which each of us have mm -hmm. and um i think you know um Speaking for myself, and I know for a lot of people, probably when we're, when we're little, we think about the guardian angel a lot, you know, when we see images of it. But then when we become adults, it, it's something which can slip from our mind a little bit. Would you agree with that? I do agree with that wholeheartedly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, and to think, well, the guardian angel is something which we have very clear um, scriptural testimony for. I mean, Christ says that our angels are always in the sight uh, of the Father. So to know that to each one of us has been assigned this magnificent spiritual being, and the very least of the angels is incomparably more powerful, uh, more just, more beautiful, stronger than any human being. And each one of us has one of these angels uh, assigned to our protection, which, uh, which I think is wonderful to contemplate, because it's a testimony of the great love which God has for us. And, uh, you know, it's something which perhaps we don't reflect upon enough in our daily lives, that, that this uh, angelic presence is always there with us, not only to protect us, but also to advise us, to lead us, uh, to choose what is right, to resist temptation, and so forth. And they unselfishly love us out of love for him. Out of the, their great love and service to him, they love us, which is another incredible yeah. uh, devotion to or testament to the work that they take on uh, yeah. when they yeah. when they are assigned to us. Well, 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 it is, you know, and and the fact that they love us out of their love for God, the supreme divinity, I, I think is important to bear in mind all the time. Because in our daily life, of course, it can sometimes be very hard to love our brothers and sisters. Um, you know, we, we might see, well, they don't deserve our love or, you know, um, they don't matter to us or whatever we feel. But to remember the call to love them is, is not because of their own merits, whatever they may be, but because of our love for God, their creator and father. And um, to put our love for other people in the context of the love for God, 
our love for Jesus. Um, that in loving other people, we're in fact showing love to Jesus uh, and to God the Father, because he loves each one of them. One thing I encourage people to do is see or invoke an other's guardian angel, especially with people who you maybe find a little bit difficult. Know that they have an yeah. angel guardian beside them because one has been assigned to every single person as you very correctly stated. Yeah. And so you know that uh, when you are in the presence of another person, as you and I are speaking today, my guardian angel is with me and yours is with you. And uh, these uh, beings are uh, very powerful if you choose to come into relationship with them and deepen that relationship yeah. and deepen your life of grace. Um, you can always see yeah. the guardian angel in another. And that brings a kind of a immediate compassion, uh, I find, or it brings a sort of calm to almost any situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, th that, that's very true, you know, and we can easily um, focus on the faults of others or their failings or their deficiencies or whatever. But to, to turn our attention to, to the more important and the more fundamental things, that they're loved by God, they're created by God, they're created in the image of God, and God has assigned to each one of them uh, their own guardian angel, unique guardian angel. Um, and to think, well, even the person whom we might think is, you know, worthy of nothing but contempt and hatred or whatever, um, in fact, in the eyes of God, they're worthy of this great protector and, and, uh, and this great dignity, and to try to extend that to them. You know, and um, I think we see that very much in, this, in the life of St. Aloysius. I mean... He was a, a, a noble person by birth. He was very exalted. If he'd lived for longer, it, I mean, I think it's probably almost certain that he would have ended up becoming a pope. Yeah. Um, but the fact is that, that he, he, he didn't see that as being important. He saw all the earthly dignities and earthly merits as being of much less consequence to that fundamental fact, that existential reality, that each of us is created and loved by God and in the image of God and protected lovingly by God. He writes so beautifully on this, and I have this quote to read about that, which is, quote, Oh, my reader, consider how many times in this life perils would have overcome you had your guardian angel not solicitously turned them away. Indeed, yeah. since you have survived to this day, it is certain that your guardian angel has, got, has done this already a vast multitude of times, the majority of which are wholly unknown to you, close quote. And yeah. that is such a reality yeah. about uh, our lives yeah. and uh, how we have not considered, A, we think we're doing it all ourselves and uh, God is working through yeah. us constantly and and has sent yeah. this protector who's done all this. Can you yeah. just talk about that? Yeah. 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 Well, yes, indeed. So, you know, it's probably something we don't think about too much, you know, but, but each of us, you know, who are listening today have made it alive to this day. Um, we probably, most of us have made it with our, our faith, you know, intact, more or less. And you think about... Um, the chances of that happening are actually pretty small in the world in which we live. So um, it's not due to our merits that we've arrived at this state. I mean, we've arrived today, this glorious day, uh, the Feast of the Sacred Heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, we're alive. We're hopefully reasonably healthy. Hopefully our faith is, is more or less intact. Of course, it's always, you know, a struggle, but... We're listening to this program. We're reading this book. So that, that, that's test of testimony that we've still got that fire of faith within us. And, you know, you think that is such a glorious privilege. And how has it come about? I mean, it's, it's not just chance. It's not that we're wonderful people and we've somehow merited this for ourselves. But, you know, I think we've got this tremendous debt of gratitude to God and 
to the guardian angel, who is, of course, the, the minister and the servant of God in all of this. You know, and to reflect, let's be thankful of, of what we've arrived at on this day, of all that we've got, all that we could have lost. And, you know, if we reflect back on our lives, for a lot of us, we could have think, well, how easily it would have been to fall into sin, how easily it would have been to turn away from the faith at different times. And if we look around, I think, at, you know, our, our friends, our colleagues, our relatives, whatever, you know, it, it's actually a minority of people who actually make it through life uh, alive and well and with their faith intact. Mm. So we've got a, a, an, an immense thing to be grateful for, I think, David. Yeah, I agree. And, I mean, Jesus himself in Matthew tells us of these holy angels, and I'll just read that. Uh, it's Matthew 18. Take care that you do not disdain one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels are always before the face of the Heavenly Father. Close yeah. quote. And here he's telling us actually that they constantly live the beatific vision, which we as Christians are striving for every day, hopefully, if we've been given the gift of baptism, and it is a gift, then we should be working toward that sanctity. Um, yeah. Yes, yes, indeed, you know. And, uh, you know, to think that the, the awesome fact that we have this angel uh, who, is, who is also a saint because they're enjoying the beatific vision um, as our constant companion, whether we know it or not, this saint who is working for us as our, as our servant, as our best friend, as our protector. And uh, I think it's truly an awesome thought. And uh, it's something which, which it's very useful for, for Catholics to revisit. You know, it's, I mean, I, I guess it's something which most kids think about a lot, but, but for adults, it's something we tend to think about much less frequently. But, but to, to thank our guardian angel and also to, to turn to our guardian angel as a helper and an intercessor in times of need. Yeah, uh, I mean, when one contemplates the work of the holy angels, one almost naturally wants to imitate them. And uh, have you found that yeah. to be true for yourself while you were translating yeah, this yeah, volume? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have, I have very much. And you know, of course, I'm a, a Benedictine monk. One of the things within our monastic tradition, especially in the in the ancient uh, monastic tradition of the Desert Fathers and and so forth is the idea of trying to lead an angelic life. And, you know, when, when you say that, it might seem like something which is, like, far-fetched or, or impractical or impossible or whatever. But, you know, to think, what is it which the angels are doing? And uh, as I mentioned before, it's only the, the two lowest ranks of the angels, the angels and the archangels, which actually perform service to people on Earth. The others are all involved in contemplation of God in his splendor. And to think, well, that actually is our highest duty. God created the universe for the whole purpose of contemplating and glorifying him. And if we can do that, you know, a little more, um, then we approach that angelic life. And, you know, one of the things which was said about St. Aloysius is that he lived like an angelic life even while he was alive. Um, and that, you know, it might seem kind of impossible or might seem artificial, but, you know, I think human beings, in fact, can do that to a certain degree through the grace of God. That we have within ourselves this spiritual reality um, which, is, which is perfectly capable of emulating the angels. And we need to bear in mind also that the human soul in its very nature is, in fact, superior to the angels that the human soul will be united to God uh, in a closer sense than even the seraphim and the cherubim. And according to ancient traditions, this was why Lucifer rebelled against God. After humanity had been created, Lucifer said, you know, I'm, I'm not going to serve humankind because they're so much less than what I am, because I'm glorious and radiant and purely spiritual. But despite this, in our potential, human beings have, uh, have this, this potential for glory, for bliss, for beatitude, for 
uh, union with God, which surpasses even that of the seraphim. So I think to, to keep in mind the imitation of the angels, as well as the imitation of the saints, as a model for our Christian life. Yeah, and you, you said, I heard the word dignity earlier, and I, I really feel like that is a beautiful w way to describe the angels. Yeah. There's a dignity to them. Uh, and there's a dignity because they chose from the very beginning to serve. Uh, one third didn't yeah. choose to serve, but the ones that did choose to serve are in service to us out of love for him. But can you can you just talk about their dignity? Yeah. So so this this uh, wonderful dignity of of the good angels, as you mentioned, the ones that didn't rebel. Um, comes from their humility and their choice of service. Um, and I think this is something which human beings can emulate as well. You know, and you think, what makes a dignified human being? And, you know, dignity is perhaps something we don't think about or talk about so much today. But I think we still sense it, you know, when we, when we meet a dignified person and whatever. And a dignified person, if you think about it, is always a good person. Yes. Um, so just... Yeah, so, so, so to strive for this value of human dignity. And in, in, in striving for dignity, I think we'll also avoid most sins. Because most sins, if you think about it, are, are actually quite undignified. That they're contrary to this value of dignity. So if we, if we make as one of our goals in life um, to, to, to emanate, to embrace dignity, to embody dignity... I think we'll actually end up being uh, very good Christians. There's also something noble and royal about what you're describing, and that is uh, these beings are in service in uh, Christ's court as our king, as the ultimate king of humanity and of the universe. And so there's a, a nobility that goes with that as well, also part of what we are called to. Yeah, there is indeed, you know, and this is something which is so closely related to dignity, you know, and um, I think uh, in, in our modern world, sometimes when people hear words like nobility and so forth, they'll, they'll kind of tend to reject them and think either they're artificial or they're reflecting some kind of, you know, hierarchical system and so forth. But each human being... Um, is called to this great nobility. You know, we've all got the image of God and we all should be uh, noble regardless of what our situation or position in life is. You know, and even the humblest worker, the person who's doing the most kind of apparently menial job can show dignity and nobility. And, uh, you know, I think this is something which we really should strive for very hard in our culture. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, because... This, the sins which plague our world today are all to do with a kind of degradation, uh, degeneration of the human character, whereas nobility, dignity and so forth raise it up, raise it up to its full potential. And you know what, I mean, even in people who aren't religious, if you see this character of dignity and nobility, it's, it's certainly a, a step in the right direction. You know, it's, it's a drawing us to what's higher, to, to, to the greater possibilities of our human character. Yeah, yeah, totally. And, you know, we really only know the names of three archangels. And um, yeah, yeah. Raphael, obviously, Gabriel, and uh, St. Michael. Um, but can you, yeah. he, he goes on in the book to um, describes the, the meaning of the names and the I'll part of the, of the name, like yeah. the, the last so, of us. Can you explain so of course, that? Yeah. So, of course, the, 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 uh, the final part, the L, is one of the traditional names of God. And, you know, you'll see this in, in the name El Shaddai. Um, so, basically, El was one of the Hebrew names of God. So the name uh, Michael means who is like God. And this was from the, um, from the story 
that in the very beginning when uh, Lucifer rebelled and Michael stood up against him and what he said was, who is like God? Um, as if who could be equal to God? Who would dare to make themselves the equal of God? Now, the name uh, Raphael signifies the medicine of God. And, of course, um, Raphael gets his biggest appearance in Scripture in the book of Tobit. Mm -hmm. And he serves there virtually as a kind of uh, archetype or paradigm of the guardian angel to, uh, to Tobias and, you know, accompanies him on his journey and helps him out in all different ways. And then, uh, finally, we have Gabriel. And Gabriel, of course, was the one who conveyed... Uh, well, he really only appears in Scripture on one occasion, but it's a very important, in fact, the very most important occasion mm -hmm. as the, uh, the one who heralds the Incarnation. And this is the strength of God. And uh, the strength of God, which is, of course, Jesus Christ himself, you know, mm -hmm. who is the wisdom and the strength of God. So, yeah, so these are the, the three official names of the angels. Now, I should mention... Uh, David, that there are also another bunch of names which are derived from the, uh, from the uh, non-canonical books. So the non-canonical books, of course, are, you know, books like uh, Enoch, uh, Fourth Esdras, and so forth. They're not rejected by the church, but they're not kind of accepted with the same degree of, of credence. So they supply us also with the names of the seven principal angels of God, uh, beyond this, there are different sources for other names of angels. But interestingly, the church has, has directed us, you know, you don't need to try to find out the names of your own guardian angel. Yeah, it's, dis it's discouraged, actually, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, the well, it is. And, and I mean, yeah, it was, it was a big thing in the late Middle Ages and the early modern era. Hmm. Um, but... Uh, you know, it said, well, you, you know, you don't need to do that. And you think about the angel which appeared before the birth of Samson and said, uh, don't ask my name, for it is wonderful. Hmm. So we should be content to know that we've got a guardian angel, mm -hmm. but, you know, we don't need to, uh, to, to go beyond what is the official teaching of, of the church and the official teaching of Scripture. Yeah, and the correct way to invoke or address would be just to say angel guardian or guardian angel and uh, indeed, they, indeed. they know who yeah. they are <laughs> you well, don't you well, don't have do. to give and them I, I pet this, names or anything like yeah. that that's and, uh, and i think this is is one of the wonderful things about saint aloysius gonzaga's writing that even though he was only a young man he was an extremely intelligent student so all of his writings in this book um are founded quite strictly upon uh thomistic theology so we've got nothing in here which uh, you know which goes beyond that or which which should be doubted yeah can you just talk about when and how we can invoke our holy angels and how we can begin to create a relationship with this being that is beside us at all times yeah yeah so um saint aloysius gonzaga um is said to have given devotions to his guardian angel three times a day um, but, you know, I think for most people, it's probably enough to do it once a day. When we get to the end of the day, um, you know, assuming nothing too disastrous has happened in the day, if we find ourselves alive at the end of the day, that's something to give thanks for, and to th give thanks for our, to our guardian angel, you know, that, we, that we've made it through the day, that, you know, we, that our faith is intact, even though it might be shaky at times, admittedly, um, that we've avoided dangerous sin and so forth. So that's one dimension. I think the other dimension is when we're in times of need, when we really feel that we need this guardian angel to help us. And that might be if we feel we're in a, you know, a, a, a situation of great peril or stress or danger, or we feel that we're in a situation of great temptation, you know, when we, we think, oh, well, you know, um, I could very easily commit some really bad sin right at the moment. 
Um, and in those moments, to call upon our angel. And that's such an effective thing, because in calling upon the angel, we remind ourselves that everything we do is done in the presence of God. Um, so I think, you know, it's a, that, that's a wonderful thing. So to keep that guardian angel in mind uh, at the end of the day and also in times of particular peril and stress. It's such a... The child childlike prayer that we mentioned earlier in our discussion, angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here, ever this day be by my side to light and guard and rule and guide. Such a simple yeah. invocation to add to your daily prayer, uh, along with obviously the the prayer our Lord gave us and the prayer to our, our blessed uh, lady. But and yeah. that, that is another way. It's just such a small prayer, which, as you mentioned, sort of we carry through childhood, yeah. but we sort of forget as adults. And um, yeah. it's, just a, it's just a lovely prayer to remember. It, it is very, very much so, very much so. You know, and I think related to that is having images of angels, you know, and there are so many beautiful artistic depictions of the angels and um these, I mean, of course, we can't say that they're 100% realistic or everything because it's entirely beyond human senses. But, but you know, to have an image of an angel, and, and that's something which I like to have, uh, you know, in my own monastic cell, to mm -hmm. remind me that there's always this um, communicator to God who's with me all the time, you know, and, and I think that makes such a great difference in our lives. Yeah. It, uh, it both helps us to resist temptation and, and gives that confidence that whatever we do is done in the presence of our loving God. So beautiful. Oh, Father Nixon, I just am so grateful for this time together today and uh, the, the fact that you took the time to translate this work for the first time from Latin into English so that people can yeah. really uh, come come to the work of this saint and uh, put this devotion into their lives. Yeah, well, yeah, thanks, uh, David, uh, very much for the opportunity of speaking about this work today and also a special thanks to Tan Books for, for bringing this, uh, this book to Catholic readers, you know, um, to, to, to help this devotion, which is so important and, uh, and which is so beautiful. So uh, thank you all, and, and God bless you on this uh, wonderful day of the solemnity of the most sacred heart of Jesus Christ. Check us out on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, our website, thefocusingway.com.